Okay, this lecture is about translation, right? We talked about transcription, which is copying DNA molecule and making an RNA molecule. The way to remember translation is it's just like the word says. You're translating from one language, the language of nucleic acid, to another language, the language of amino acids. Okay, So transcription is copying. That's what the word means. Translation is actually translating from one language to another, just like you would translate from English to Spanish or Farsi to English or whatever languages you know. First part is we want to talk about or remind you about proteins because that's what we're making. So remember that proteins are the workers of the cell, right? They have lots of different property or functions. They can be enzymes, they can be structure, they can be movement, they can be our um, transport molecules across the membrane, receptors. Okay, so proteins are what's really making the cell have its characteristics. And translation is how we make those proteins. I want you to be able to recognize the building block of proteins, which are amino acids. seem to want to work. Should not be good. Let's try one more time. Okay. So, amino acids are monomers of proteins. So you want to be able to recognize the structure of amino acids. So on the left here, it shows the amino group, which has the nitrogen. The other end of the amino acid is the carboxyl group, which gives it its acid <clears throat> property. And amino acids, or I should say proteins, have directionality. So they have an N terminus that's made first and the C terminus is where you hook the next amino acid. So just like 5 prime to 3 prime with DNA, amino acids are made in a specific direction. Right? So you're always hooking on to the carboxyl group. They're hooked together by dehydration synthesis, and you form a peptide bond right between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amino group of the next. And our water isn't really shown here, but you get an O and you get two H's. So remember to look for that repeating backbone, NCC is one amino acid, and then you would connect NCC for the next amino acid, I should make this a different color, and that is your peptide bond. Okay, so we have... Um, actually over, but 20 standard amino acids. And what I want you to notice from this chart is that the yellow is that common NCC backbone. The R is what we have here. This is the unique group for each amino acid. Okay, So we have very small R groups. We have very large 
R groups. The R groups are what gives the protein its <clears throat> ability to fold and form tertiary structure, and you know that structure equals function. The R groups have different characteristics, such as nonpolar and polar and charged, acidic and basic, and this is what drives protein folding. So just another image for you to look at, identifying the different R groups. Now, of course, they're not always going to be on top. I'm not going to make that so easy for you. But if you recognize the N, C, C, you've got the backbone. The middle C always have us one hydrogen. And then whatever else is hooked to that middle C, that's the R group. And again, this is showing you the N and C terminus. So you can see that it can be written, like I said, I think I said, different ways. You might have it to say NH2, you might have it to say COOH. Don't be confused, it's the N and the C terminus. All right? And we've talked before about structure. Primary structure, remember, is the sequence of amino acids. Secondary structure is based on hydrogen bonds. Oh, this pen. Right, and this is our alpha helix and our beta pleated sheet. Tertiary structure is based on the R groups. that gives it its unique function. Remember, quaternary means two or more proteins <clears throat> working together. Okay, so I also want you to understand a little bit about how proteins fold. We've talked before about hydrogen bonds. There are also ionic bonds where you have charges that attract. Hydrophobic effects means some of those amino acids want to get away from water, right? So they're going to move towards the inside of the protein. Van der Waals forces are just very weak interactions that help things um, interact, stay together. And disulfide bridges are actually covalent bonds, very strong, just <clears throat> between the serine amino acids, between these sulfur groups. Okay. So this again is all due to R group interactions. So the next set of objectives is going to be about translation, um, how it works, and some of the more mechanisms of it. So you are going to be given an mRNA codon table. So this is your translation code. to know is that the code is all in groups of three. And the code is called a codon table. So a codon is three nucleotides 
get code for one amino acid. So if you look at this chart, you see names of amino acids, and then you see the one letter code. And we're going to use the one letter code because that's kind of easier to deal with and grade and see if you're right. There's also a couple special codons. AUG, you need to memorize, is the start codon. Every protein that we work with is going to start with AUG. And what AUG does, it's a, it sets up what we call the reading frame. We're going to look at that next, but it tells us which groups of three they are. You also have three stop codons. Stop codons represent the end of the protein chain. There's no amino acids encoded, so when you translate and hit a stop codon, you're done translating, even if there's more RNA afterwards. And then we're going to talk about at the end of the lecture the idea that some <coughs> amino acids, actually most amino acids, have more than one codon that codes for them. And we'll talk about the redundancy of the genetic code. So let's look at this idea of a reading frame. Reading frame just means groups of three codons. And the start codon defines the reading frame. So when you're asked to translate something, this right now is your mRNA. And you're going to scan the mRNA until you find an AUG start codon. And after that, just like they did here, you're going to go through and mark out every three codons. Okay, that is used with the table on the next page to determine the amino acid sequence. So now you're translating. So if you looked at AUG, you would go to this table and you would say A, always look at the first letter here, AUG is M. So we write an M. And then you look at CAG. You go back to the table. You look for the C's and you scan over to the AG. CAG is glutamine. So you write a Q. That's the next amino acid added. We have another CAG. That's another glutamine. GGC. GGC is glycine. And you look for U, U, U. F, okay. ACC, <coughs> CC, is cleaning T. That's translation. Okay. You found the reading frame. Found your groups of three, and then you use the mRNA codon table to translate them to the language of amino acids. So let's have you try it. Oh, I forgot to put that there. Take a break, pause, and try to translate. So for this one, I already gave you AUG as the first three. But again, go through, mark the groups of three so that you can use the codon table. Oops, and I was off. Don't do that. I don't know why I had an extra one. Okay. 
So then as we start to translate, we know that AUG is methionine. And I have a little code on table with me so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth. GAG is glutamic acid. AGU is serine. UCA is also serine. UAU is tyrosine. UGA is stopped. So hopefully when you did this, you stopped. Even though there are um, additional nucleotides, stop means stop. So a lot of times when we do this as a clicker question, students will put, they'll keep translating. Okay, you've got to stop at the stop codon. One more concept for this idea of a reading frame is that you can get a mutation in your DNA that causes a mutation in the um, RNA. And so in this case, we had an addition of a U. And that shifted the whole reading frame, right? All our groups of three were a little bit different if you compared these two. And that's what's called a frame shift mutation. You can have frame shift mutations from deletions as well. The point of this is I just want you to understand that you're always going to start with that AUG and you're always going to read the groups of three. Now let's talk about the machinery of translation, which is our ribosomes. So we always talked about ribosomes being for protein synthesis, and now we're going to talk about how. The ribosome subunits are made in the nucleolus. And ribosomes are made of RNA, ribosomal RNA, and proteins. And they have two subunits. They have a large and a small subunit. And we'll, I'll show you where that comes into play. But basically, in between, in the space between the subunits, your mRNA is lined up so that the codons can be read. What's pretty cool about ribosomes is that the ribosomal RNA is the catalytic part. That means that the ribosomal RNA is what makes the peptide bonds. So it's actually not a protein that's making this reaction happen. It's actually the RNA molecule. So let's look at this a little bit closer. All right. So we have our mRNA, and our mRNA is going to be read 5 prime to 3 prime. So your codon chart is listing the codons, 5 prime to 3 prime. The ribosome has three kind of spaces. For sites, and they are E, P, A. E stands for exit. P stands for where the peptide bond is made. comes in. It 
So we've talked about mRNA. We've talked about ribosomal RNA. We have one more type of RNA, and that's tRNA, which is called transfer RNA. I call it the translator RNA, and we'll talk about tRNA in a minute more, but it is what brings on in the amino acids. So this is supposed to show you a chain of amino acids. Okay, so let's look at these steps. So there's three steps of translation, or three stages, um, initiation, elongation, and termination. And we're going to look at each of these. So eukaryotic translation initiation. So we're talking about eukaryotes here. Pretty interesting. What you can see here is this is the small ribosomal subunit. And the small ribosomal subunit binds to the five prime cap. So remember in RNA processing, you get a five prime cap, you get a poly A tail, and you get the introns spliced out. And so this complex, along with some other proteins, actually binds the five prime cap and scans to the first, well not the first, I should say. Scans to find the AUG to put the reading frame. Okay. The reason I backtracked on saying the first AUG is um, it's a little more complicated than that. The AUG has to be in a special sequence. Okay. But what I want you to see up here is that there's a tRNA that moves with this um, uh, complex. Okay, and it's called the initiator tRNA. And it's looking for that AUG in the right context. When it finds it, right here, then the large subunit comes on and the tRNA is put into the P site because you want to start making the peptide chain and we're going to now read the next codon in the A site. I'm going to look at this in a little more detail here. Okay. So this is translation initiation. The first amino acid is always methionine, along with this special initiator tRNA. And the way this works is through base pairing. So this blue is your tRNA. And you have your AUG mRNA, 5 prime to 3 prime. And the tRNA is going to know it's right when it matches U, A, C, 3 prime to 5 prime. Right? Through base pairing. My pen is not letting me. That's not very well today. Okay? So, base pairing rules and anti-parallel work in translation as well. Super, super important. Okay. Once we set this AUG into the right spot, the P site, then we automatically have the next three nu nucleotides or the next codon that can be read. And notice that I've put um, some links for you to watch animations to see this. Um, this one shows you how scanning works. 
So let's talk about that tRNA molecule. Okay. tRNAs oops, bring amino acids to the ribosome. So right here, there would be an amino acid attached. An amino acid that's attached is determined by the anticodon. So right down here you have something called the anticodon. And it's called that because it base pairs with the codon antiparallel. It has this interesting clover leaf structure. Um, this is what it really looks like all twisted up. But you see the anticodon, and this is one strand of RNA, so this is why it's I'm not kind of clustered out of here. Three prime, going down, two, five prime. So you're going to be antiparallel, you're going to have base parallels. It brings in the amino acid to the ribosome. So, let's see if you can do this. Given the following codon, so codon stands for mRNA, what is the tRNA anticodon? So the way you solve this is you say, okay, the mRNA is AUG, the tRNA has to be antiparallel, and base pairing. Right? So it's going to be U A C. Right? Base pair. Three prime U A C. Anti-parallel. Okay, try this one. Which of the following tRNAs could not bind the amino acid proline? So you're given the codon chart. These are the codes for codons for proline. It's always written five prime to three prime. My little thing is heating up. Sorry for the noise. Um, so if you tried this, five prime C C and then something, right? Let's see if we can fight it down. The anticodon would have to be <coughs> G, G, and then some other letter, right? It could be an A, a G, a U or a C. Okay. So GGA would work. And if you looked at this backwards, GGU would work. So both of these would work. So the question is which one would not bind? So the answer is A. A is actually the codon. tRNAs have to have the anticodon. Okay, so we talked about initiation. Elongation is just the continuous synthesis, and we go from start codon to stop codon. Oops. So, let's see if this will work. It's a little scary because they're saying the flash player might not be around much longer. All right, so I just want to walk you through this. Chain process. elongation begins with the binding so of a tRNA, which recognizes the next codon in the mRNA to the A site of the ribosome. This is catalyzed. And this one has a lot of extra information. 
the next TRNA comes and reads the codon in the A site. Analyzed by the EFTU transcription factor and requires the hydrolysis of a GTP. Once the tRNA binds in the A site of the ribosome, the polypeptide chain is moved from the tRNA in the P site to the amino acid attached to the tRNA in the A site. Peptidyl transferase, a protein RNA complex present in the 50S ribosomal subunit, catalyzes the formation of this new peptide bond between the amino acids. The ribosome then translocates to the next codon. This process is promoted by elongation factor G and requires another GTP. This places the empty tRNA molecule in the E site of the ribosome and moves the tRNA containing the growing polypeptide chain in the P site. The next codon in the mRNA chain is positioned in the A site. The uncharged or empty tRNA in the E site then leaves the ribosome and a cycle of chain elongation is completed. Through subsequent cycles of chain elongation, the polypeptide chain continues to elongate one amino acid at a time. So that's a nice little animation you can watch with the link below. This is just showing you in still motion that elongation just goes through this continuous series of bringing in a new tRNA to the A site, making the peptide bond, right, see so the peptide bond, everything shifts, so this tRNA is now in the P site, the tRNA that doesn't have an amino acid anymore is exited, and we repeat. So that's elongation. All right. Termination, let's see, I'm going to do this first. Termination is a little bit interesting. So this is when you're at a stop codon. So when a stop codon, like UAA, comes into the A site, there is no tRNA. Instead, it's a protein called a release factor. And since there's no Let's see, I'm going to put release factor comes to a site. I really apologize for this crappy pen. Ah, okay, so the release factor comes in, and since there's no tRNA to hook the next amino acid to, the protein is released, and the signal is to stop, and the ribosome releases the mRNA. Okay? That's why stop codons mean stop. Even though there's still more RNA that you could translate, the ribosome is actually falling apart, and so you don't get any more translation. So let's see if this little guy will work. Termination begins when a stop codon appears in the A site. Since there is no tRNA corresponding to the stop codon, a release factor binds in the A site. The binding of the release factor causes the polypeptide chain to be cleaved from the tRNA. The polypeptide is released and then the tRNA is released. In the last step, the two ribosomal subunits and the mRNA dissociate from each other. This completes the termination process. That's termination. So you have initiation where you scan for the first AEG from the cap, elongation where you go through and you continue to make the polypeptide chain by the tRNAs reading the mRNA sequence, and termination when you come to a stop codon, you stop. All right, so I want you to try this one. And so this one, the reminder, which I won't always give you, is be sure to start at the start codon. So you actually need to scan until you find 
that AUG. And then you mark your groups of three. Which one do this, right? One, two, three. Until you come, and I just happen to know my stop foot arms, until you come to a stop foot arm. Okay. And just so you double check yourself, the answer to this would be C. So you want to be able to practice, or you want to be able to, for quizzes and exams, translate mRNA into amino acid sequence. Okay, which amino acid will be added to the polypeptide chain next? Okay, so this is trying to show you hydrogen bonds between the tRNA and the mRNA, and the question is, what's going to come in next? So to solve this one, all you're looking for is the GCG codon on your mRNA table which encodes for alanine. So we've kind of come full circle, right? We've talked about our DNA and done transcription to mRNA. And then we've talked about translating. So now let me talk, tell you a little bit about some of the other words you've seen. So now you know about the start codon, right? And that sets up the three codon reading frame until you hit the stop codon. So all of the RNA before the start codon is called the 5' prime untranslated region because it's not translated. Okay? And it's at the beginning of the mRNA, which is the 5' prime end. After the stop codon, you have the 3' prime untranslated region, right? Because it's not going to be translated because the ribosome has fallen apart um, once it hit the stop codon. So that just gives you a little bit of orientation to some of these other terms you've seen on previous slides. This also means that I could give you either strand of DNA or an mRNA and you should be able to translate it. Okay. So we're gonna, I'm going to put, post some worksheets where you can practice going back and forth between um, coding, template, and mRNA and doing translation. It really makes your brain work. This is just a diagram trying to get you to see the connections between the coding strand, the template strand, the mRNA, and the tRNAs. Okay? So here's all your anticodons. Your mRNA codons. This is a nice little summary. So I want you to remember that transcription happens in the nucleus. RNA processing, so the cap tail and splicing out the introns, is also in the nucleus. And then what we call the mature RNA comes out and finds a cytoplasm. So translation, remember, happens on ribosomes the ribosomes are either free floating in the cytoplasm or on the rough ER Okay. One last concept, and then we're done. And that, I mentioned earlier, is the redundancy of the genetic code. So you'll notice that most amino acids have multiple codons. The exceptions to this is methionine, the start codon, tryptophan, oops, only has one codon, Everything else has at least two. Serine actually has, there it is, six. 
Um, leucine, where's leucine? Leucine also has six. And that means that multiple DNA or RNA sequences can code for the same protein. multiple DNA or RNA sequences can code for the same protein. So I'm going to give you some challenge problems where you go actually from amino acid sequence to mRNA sequence or to DNA sequence. And sometimes you're going to have multiple options. Okay, so if you have a tyrosine amino acid, right, your mRNA, here's your amino acid, your mRNA could be UAU or it could be UAC. So it gets complicated. So I want you to do one problem to try that, and then we'll make sure we've covered everything in the outcomes. So this question asks, how many different mRNAs could code for the following peptide? So if you look on your codon table, methionine is coded by A, U, G, and alanine, there's my little codon table, Sorry, I need the big one. I can't see my little one. Alanine, there you are. Could be G C uh, G C U or G C C or G C A or G C G. So you could actually have four different mRNAs the code for the same peptide. So now you can imagine how it gets really crazy if you had, you know, say three anine next. So then you'd have four more options for each of these and it gets wild. So a lot of times when we're looking at um, comparing genetics between organisms to see if they make the same protein, we don't want to look at the DNA sequence because it could be varied, we want to look at the protein sequence because that's really the functional unit. That's higher level, but I want you to kind of be exposed to that idea. All right, so let's look through our outcomes. You know the building blocks of proteins and how they're linked together. So this is your amino acids. And we have peptide bonds. And everything is linked together by dehydration synthesis. Be able to draw or recognize the generic structure of amino acid. Identify the R group, the amino, and the carboxyl group. Know what kind of bonds joins the amino acids. We already said that peptide. Identify the peptide bond, right? So that's going to be... On. N C C peptide bond. N C C peptide bond. Right? Explain why the R group is the only structure in the amino acid that is considered when determining the chemical properties. Because everything else is the same, right? This whole backbone with the hydrogen here is all the same. So it's the R group that makes each amino acid and therefore each protein unique. <clears throat> Review your primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structures. We've talked about that. And we've talked about the types of interactions used to form tertiary structure, right? The third level to give the protein shape and function. Be able to translate a given piece of mRNA or DNA into amino acid sequence. I will always give you the mRNA table, the codon table. Be able to use it, which kind of goes with it. Um, explain why it's degenerate. 
No, we didn't talk about that. Um, we're going to take out this objective. Yeah, okay. All right. Explain how the reading frame is established. Think start codon. Determine the redundancy, that's what we talked about. How many different mRNAs could be produ could produce the same amino acid sequence, right? Know the difference between your mRNA, your tRNA, and your ribosome, ribosomal RNA, sorry. You've got the ribosome structure and the function of the EPA sites. We've talked about translation, initiation, elongation, and termination. Okay, be able to figure out codon and anticodon. Right? So given it either way, anticodon to codon. Anticodon is always on the tRNA. Codon is always the RNA. Oh, and we didn't talk about this. So explain how different cells have different structures and functions, even though all cells of an organism have the same set of genes. I talked about this more when we talked about the promoter in transcription. So the big concept I want you to understand, and we'll get more to this in genetics, is that you have 22,000 genes. Every cell has the ability to express 22,000 genes. But we have very different cell types, right? You have muscle cell, you have cells of your liver, you have skin cells. And so even though they all have the same genetic information, they don't express the same proteins. Proteins give the cell their function, their characteristics, and when we talk about genetics, their phenotype. So it's all based on which genes are expressed in a cell. Okay. So the genome here means all of your genetic information. Proteome means the proteins that are actually expressed in that cell type. So we'll talk about this a little bit more um, um, in the last lecture on the endomembrane system and kind of bringing all of this together. All right, work on those worksheets. Make sure you can do translation and you understand how it works.